Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Space Place Canada YouTube channel. Um, Space Place Planetarium Canada is a nonprofit multidisciplinary group of professionals uh, determined to bring an iconic physical public planetarium uh, back to Toronto, uh, supporting a virtual planetarium for Canada and the world. Uh, Toronto has not had a public planetarium since 1995, and the city is the largest tourist city without one. It's a critical missing piece of Toronto's tourism and educational infrastructure. Uh, we encourage the audience to get involved and email us to inquire about our work, uh, being a volunteer, or applying to be a member. We are engaged in advocacy and planning, recruitment, events, and fundraising. It brings me great joy to introduce the topic of tonight's event, NASA's largest and loudest test chamber, with none other than Dr. Ramani Ramakrishnan, who will be joining us shortly. Throughout the course of the evening, I'd like to ask you to hold your questions until the end. We're able to host amazing events like these, greatly due to our sponsors. And so I'd like to kick things off by thanking our Jupiter sponsors, which are MDA, as well as Larson and Tubero. And we'd like to share a brief message from MDA. <laughs> Pratt & Whitney, which is a Mars level sponsor, uh, as well as two Mercury level sponsors, which are Global Public Affairs and Stradia. Thanks go out again to all our sponsors for your continued support of Space Place Planetarium Canada. We have many, many more events and outreach initiatives lined up for the new year, and this means that you can help us make them happen. With that, we are asking for donations, and I thank you for already being generous with your time here tonight, but uh, give me one second. Uh, for a small donation of $10, you can receive a unique download card uh, with planetarium music for the, from the McLaughlin Planetarium. And I think it's only fitting given the theme of our event tonight. What's next? For a donation of $50, or more, uh, you not only get the music card, but you'll also get a Space Place Canada branded face mask for stylish outings on the town, as well as Bob, McDon Bob McDonald's book titled An Earthling's Guide to Outer Space, which is a great read, uh, but also a neat gift idea too. Whether you'd like the music card only or the special combo of amazing Space Place swag, please send your mailing address to the email on the screen uh, which is chair at spaceplacecanada.ca. I'll also put in the general link uh, in the chat. And uh, I hope that you'll be sure to check it out. If you donate without the awesome swag, you can receive a charitable receipt. So without further ado, let's introduce our speaker for the evening. I met Dr. Ramakrishnan in 2018 during his tenure at Toronto Metropolitan University, where he worked for the Department of Architectural Science for 36 years. Although he's designed several courses over his academic career, his love for teaching students is what's kept him going. Uh, in collaboration with local architects, Professor Ramakrishnan designed the acoustics of a 340-seater auditorium in Chennai, India for the Asian School of Journalism. Shortly after its grand opening in October 2018, he attended two concerts and can attest that they were quite a success. But I know everyone wants to hear about his NASA experience. Dr. Ramakrishnan did his graduate studies at the Joint Institute of Acoustics and Flight Sciences 
at the NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia. He then went on to become a senior acoustical analyst for one of the largest reverberation test chambers for the NASA Glenn Research Center's Plum Brook Station in, o in Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Ramani Ramakrishnan this evening. We're so honored to have you join us tonight. So I'm on, <clears throat> I'm on now? You're up. Okay, good evening. Uh, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me because I really miss the planetarium in Toronto. I came to Toronto in 1982 and had some very fond memories of visiting the planetarium a number of times. And I'm quite unhappy and saddened that they had to close it uh, for whatever reason. And uh, Toronto as a, one of the largest cities in Canada definitely deserves a good planetarium. And I'm happy that uh, my little minor contributions have convinced people to bring the planetarium to Toronto. I'll be very happy about that. Now today, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> uh, my involvement uh, with uh, a large team uh, when we want to design the largest and the loudest test chamber uh, in for NASA Glenn in Cleveland. But this site is in Plumbrook Station in Sandusky, Ohio. My presentation summary is basically broken down to, I'll give a brief introduction. Of course, I do need to acknowledge my whole team uh, that was definitely in charge of getting this project underway to completion. I want to give you a background of why we need uh, these test chambers uh, for what purpose. And want to talk about the specification and how we went about pre preparing a proposal and winning the proposal and then the overall stage right from get-go, the design and all the changes that NASA were to make and how the final design went uh, quite far away from our original proposal, but still uh, it was completed. It was commissioned in 2011 and we had a clean bill of success from NASA Glenn uh, that the chamber is working very well. <clears throat> Uh, what is an RATF, Reverberation Acoustic Chamber Facility? Why do we need this? You know, every single space article, even a, a small satellite to the Canada Arm and all the many of the uh, space modules, uh, test vehicles that need to go into space, they undergo a number of tests. They go through a, a vacuum chamber test. Uh, they are put on a vibration table and they were uh, shaken to maybe even three, four Gs at six degrees of freedom. And then they'll put them in, uh, inside a, a chamber where a loud, uh, large noise level is created for a period of five to 20 minutes to make sure that nothing goes wrong with this prototype. It's not a model, it's an actual thing that's going to go onto space because even a dinky little satellite costs maybe hundred million dollars. So if something goes wrong, while they were launching it, uh, then we lost the whole uh, product. So they will actually test it. If something goes wrong, they'll go back to the design uh, all over again to the drawing board and then redo the design and go through this test. And this facility, there was a particular reason why NASA wanted to locate it in uh, Ohio. Before I go into its location, uh, let me talk about the team. Um, Vinita, introduced me as a senior acoustician on this project. I was one of many different people. Yes, I took care of some of the serious discussion and the design details, but I need to acknowledge uh, the three people from NASA Glenn who sort of oversaw the whole project from get-go. Uh, Bill Hughes, Mark McNillis, and Aaron, uh, Aaron Hosmer. And the whole thing was contracted by Benham Corporation from Oklahoma City and we were actually subcontract as the acoustic design uh, for <clears throat> Benham. <coughs> and the person from Benham who was involved with us uh, throughout the project is Neil Wagner. And then of course I was part of, even though I started uh, Ryerson University, Toronto Metropolitan University, I was on retainer from Aeolus Engineering. Uh, myself, uh, pro, uh, Dr. Gary Elstrom, unfortunately is no more. Uh, Sergio Raimondo, Alex Holsworth, and Ralph Leitner was the project manager. 
And we did a lot of tests at the National Research Council in Ottawa at their Uplands uh, test facility. And they do have a small test chamber, uh, reverberation acoustic test chamber. And we worked closely with Anand Graywall and his team. And the team corporation were provided some of the, what I call speakers or drivers. And the person who were involved with us is Bill Weiske. And then NASA actually hired their own consultants to supervise our work so that there's a double check in here. Cambridge Collaborative, uh, father and daughter, uh, Jerry Manning and Patricia Manning. Uh, very, Jerry Manning was a very senior acoustic consultant in North America. And his daughter, Patricia Manning, got a PhD from MIT. And they were supervising our whole project. <clears throat> so here is the location for the uh, test chamber. Uh, the donation link is overseeing my slides. Julian Winter, can you take a look at that, please? The link to the donation website is covering my slides. Thank you. So here is the where it was located. The reason for that, NASA already has a facility. In the earlier days, you have to do the vacuum chamber in one facility, and you have to do the electromagnetic testing in another chamber, and then you have to bring it to, you know, sometime all the way from Houston or Colorado to uh, some other uh, test facility uh, to do the acoustic testing and the vibration testing. But as here, NASA had a vacuum chamber already, and then there was a, a location where we could put the vibration test facility and the acoustic facility all in one, one location. So that was one of the main reasons they actually chose this particular facility. So this was used during World War II for nuclear radiation testing. And now, of course, it was uh, uh, they don't use it very much anymore. And this became an ideal location. It's in Sandusky, Ohio, about 90 miles uh, south sorry, northeast of, uh, northwest of Cleveland. <clears throat> and these were the test articles. So these are all uh, articles for Orion project, where NASA was planning to actually send a manned orbit to Mars sometime in the future. Actually, they're supposed to do this uh, stopgap landing in the moon and from there uh, launch off to uh, to Mars. And so these are the some of the articles. The reason for I'm showing these articles is that whenever we design a chamber, these articles have to fit in quite nicely within the chamber, within the acoustic chamber. So originally they gave us these articles. You can see that it's about <clears throat> uh, 18 feet in diameter and about 45 feet in height. And it was a smaller one. And the next one is slightly larger. And so this has to fit in quite nicely. Uh, and then there has to be enough space uh, between the article and the wall, the four walls and the floor and the ceiling. So this is actually an artistic rendering when we started the project. So here is the disassembly. And the walls of this particular facility is six foot thick. The floor is six foot thick concrete, poured concrete. The ceiling is six foot concrete and the walls are six foot foot concrete and our facility is going to fit within that facility. So here is a vibration test facility where they will actually put in there and shake it to between one to five G and all six degrees of freedom, three translation and three rotation. And the acoustic facility is going to be somewhat here. So once they finish the vibration test, they will move it. Um, there's a train uh, rail track is over there. They'll put it on the rail track and move it inside and uh, test the acoustic. They're going <clears> to <throat> test it for 20 minutes at a time. So here another view of the uh, artistic rendering. This is even before the project started. And these are the test specification. <clears throat> so again, um, uh, we have, because it's acoustic test, we go through many different frequencies and the overall noise level. So originally they came up with two specification, overall noise level of 166 decibels 
and then 163 decibels. So 163 decibels is way beyond uh, threshold of pain. If I put you in that room at 163 decibels, uh, your bones will get crushed within a uh, second, and within less than a minute, you will actually die. So it's very, very uh, dangerous facility to be inside. And of course, we have enough emergency stops. If, if there's a sensor inside, felt that somebody else is there, you will not be able to start the test. So these are the spectrum, and this is given in some sort of a band. Uh, this particular frequency is the <clears throat> frequency for the middle C of a piano keyboard, and we're going to go all the way from 31.5 hertz all the way to 8,000 hertz. So this particular frequency is the middle C. So this is the overall level of 163 dB, and overall level of 166 dB. You need quite a very strong low frequency, boom, boom sound. In addition, you also need quite a bit of high frequency. So they're actually going to do many different tests, but this was the worst case scenario, very high level of sound the test article is going to be exposed to. <clears throat> so we are still doing a proposal. So controlling parameters, we need sufficient volume so that the article's blockage is going to be less than 10% of the volume. And sufficient volume to provide the adequate space between the wall and the articles and the roof and the floor, ceiling and the floor. And then the room size has to be what we call a golden ratio. If any of you are an architect, uh, Vesuvius who did quite a bit of architecture in early 1400s or so, wrote a lot of uh, uh, manuscripts on how to design uh, buildings. And then he has come up with a number of golden ratio. The re golden ratio is important because uh, when you make sound within a room, a number of negative things happen. We call standing wave resonances, which is not, uh, it sounds fine when you're hearing it, but it's not good for testing purposes. So the golden ratio will avoid some of these uh, standing wave resonances that can happen within the chamber. Uh, <clears throat> Adequate space between the test articles. If you are very close to the test articles, uh, we want what is called a diffuse sound field. Wherever the test article is that, we want the sound pressure level to be the same uh, for the entire article to be tested. That means we want the diffuse sound field well within the middle of the room, away from the walls, away from the ceiling, away from the floor. We want the sound level to be absolutely within a particular error band, we're all engineers, so we cannot, nothing is perfect, so we give an error band. Uh, so within the error band, it has got to be the same sound pressure level. And then we must have enough, enough acoustic power uh, to generate the necessary overall sound levels. We are looking at 163 decibels of sound level, so the sound power to be provided by the drivers and the speakers have got to be quite sufficient. And then, <clears throat> I'm, I'm using the word horn. I'll explain that in a bit later. Uh, if you are looking at an outdoor concert, say in Toronto or in Montreal during the jazz festival, if you look at the outdoor speakers, they actually go like a horn, like a cube, a con conical shape. And that's because their uh, radiation efficiency is quite very good. I'll talk about the efficiency in a few seconds. So we're gonna use as much as possible, some sort of a conical horn and uh, in a particular way uh, to drive the sound level to the room. <clears throat> so the some of the uh, specification, for that we were very lucky. Eolus Engineering, which did the uh, chamber design, has already designed a chamber for Netherlands in uh, it's called LEAF, Large European Acoustic Facility, a number of years ago, and by designed by DSMA, which is the former Aeolus. And their size is somewhat comparable to the one we are doing for NASA Glenn. And so we were able to transfer a lot of information from the facility to our proposal and our design. So blockage less than 10%, adequate space, test articles in diffuse field. So we look at the large article, 
and trying to see whether we can get 10% or less blockage. So we made the chamber volume 67,400 cubic feet. So for the three articles, 3A, it's 9.7%, 3B, 2.17%, article 4, 11%. And even though NASA didn't want to go to 11%, the room was quite, uh, we were completely have to find out what is the total height of the space available for us within that large six foot uh, chamber that was given to us. And then we also what's called a cutoff frequency. Remember our cutoff frequency is 28.5 Hertz in the 31.5 band. So within that, we want to make sure that the sound field is diffused. So there is a very famous Schroeder, not Schrodinger. Schroeder was a famous acoustician. He did quite a lot of uh, uh, random acoustic uh, design. And he came up with a particular uh, cutoff frequency to celebrate, uh, to fix the volume. It's 2000 square root of the reverberation time divided by the volume. Uh, whereas for leaf, they use what's called 20 modes, 20 standing waves within a band. And that was the speed of sound divided by cubic root of the volume. And we decided, we convinced NASA that LEAF's uh, idea of the volume should be more than adequate. We don't need to go to Schroeder's uh, idea. So we came up with a cutoff frequency for the volume of 67,000 cubic feet, 28.5 hertz, which is well within the band which NASA want to do their test. Um, the golden ratio, LEAF used one is to 1.22 to 1.82. We followed somewhat similar principle. So we wanted a chamber of whose interior dimensions were 31.5 feet wide, 38.1 feet long, and 57 feet high. And this was adequate for all the three articles which NASA gave us to uh, use. <clears throat> and the next one is the spatial uniformity. What I mean by that is that I want the, the wherever the art test articles are going to be within the space, I want the sound level to be uniform within the error band. <clears throat> so within that particular low frequency, the modal behavior of the room, every closed room, what we call cavity in acoustics, will have many, many modes that can be generated. Uh, and <clears throat> larger the number of modes, the sound field will be diffused. Uh, for a rectangular chamber like this, uh, the mode shapes are all basically sine and cosines. So you can imagine if you have sine x plus sine 2x plus sine 3x plus sine 5x, you have about 20 of them, you'll end up getting a straight line. So you don't have a beautiful uh, sine wave. They all add up together, subtract together, and you end up getting a uniform sound level. And <clears throat> so we also trying to convince NASA our room size is adequate. So we did some testing ourselves using um, very powerful uh, software called uh, <clears throat> Ray Noise and Sys Noise. And by putting a particular source near a corner, we actually established the sound level within the room. So I'm going to show you some pictures <clears throat> of our experiment. So if you look at this, at the 31.5 hertz band, you can see that somewhere in the middle, they only vary by about one to two dB. Only when we come closer to the, uh, within a meter of the wall, they vary by about five dB. Minus seven to minus 12, they're changing by five decibels. So whereas if I look somewhere in here, they only vary by one or two dB. The error band NASA gave us at 31.5 is plus or minus three dB. So we are well with the error band. And now we have got the next higher frequency of 63 Hertz. You can see that the whole room is spatially uniform. Of course, this is what particular eye. We have given hundreds of these plots to NASA to convince them our volume and our uh, room ratio are more than adequate for NASA testing purposes. So when I go to 125, you can see the whole room is spatially uniform. It can go even within 10 centimeters of the wall. We are well within the error band uh, of needed. So now we have designed the room, uh, its volume, its 
uh, size. <clears throat> now we want to establish how much total power we need for 163 decibels. So it's a simple rectangular room. <clears throat> so we're using a very famous uh, uh, acoustician named Wallace Sabine. He worked with Harvard University late 1800s to early 1900s. He was the one who actually designed the Boston Symphony Hall. And he came up with this particular uh, relationship between the sound pressure level, SPL, and the power level. This is the number we are interested in so that we can find out how many speakers we need, how many drivers we need, uh, what's sort of the power requirement, what's sort of the room requirement we need. So this is the <clears throat> some sort of a directivity index divided by the distance between the source and the uh, chamber uh, area. And this is the absorption of the room. Every room has got sound absorption, like you and I, even as human beings, we absorb sound. But of course, in our room, our absorption is going to be very, very small. Because larger the absorption, noise level reduces. Here, we are not doing noise control. We're actually generating noise on the other end of the spectrum. So our alpha is going to be very, very small. Is the absorption coefficient goes from 0 to 1. And I'm going to show you some numbers. The absorption coefficient is going to be less than 0 0.01. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> we also have to ad uh, adjust for the drivers and the horn and the spectrum required and the horn spectrum horn efficiency. I want to give a simple example. You have your own speaker in your home. Their efficiency is less than 10%. For every one watt of electricity you put there, it's going to generate less than 0.1 watt of acoustic power. Whereas when you use a horn, there are three different kinds of horns available for us, exponential horn, parabolic horn, and hyperbolic horn. And their efficiency can be as high as 33%. Beyond that, nothing will work. I mean, this is the best one can do when you want to generate sound. And the best horn is the hyperbolic horn, but it's very, very difficult to fabricate. Uh, you will see some of the horn lengths and horn size are quite large. And you want to do a hyperbolic horn from a very small number to a very large number, it's very, very difficult. So we, have, we end up using exponential horn. It's very straightforward to uh, fabricate. <clears throat> and um, we also have to adjust for the built up of energy near the wall. So, a lot of acoustic level will be there near the wall. As you go into the room, it'll reduce somewhat. So, we have to adjust for that too. Then, we are producing what's called a non linear acoustics. Anything more than 120 dB is a non linear acoustics, like a sonic boom is a non linear acoustics, where there will be a lot of if you're producing a high level of sound in low frequency, there will be an overspill into higher frequency, which we want. That way, we don't have to drive the higher frequency very much. And we need to adjust for that too. And then all the adjustment we made by comparing to the leaf facility, we came up with the number that, OK, before I go to the overall number, I want to show you what are the available drivers, like a speaker that's available to us. One is called a hydraulic driver. Uh, it works under between 200 and 250 PS of hydraulic pressure. There is this piston, will go back and forth. It'll bang against this uh, uh, fixture here. It'll go back and forth at 200 PSI, bang it. It produces an incredibly high level of sound, acoustic power. <clears throat> and it can generate up to, two and, uh, up to 200 kilowatts of power at 200 PSI of hydraulic pressure. The next one is an electrodynamic driver. Here there are two particular uh, uh, pieces will sort of rub against each other. And they can produce between 10 to 30 kilowatts of acoustic uh, power. And they need only about 30 PSI of uh, air pressure to drive those two uh, articles going to slide against each other. These are typical speakers. <clears throat> which we use, even the most powerful speaker can only produce between one to two kilowatts. And I'm going to show you, I need about <clears throat> nearly 2,000 kilowatts of acoustic power. You can imagine how many speakers we need and where will you put them? Uh, if you put them in the room, it's going to take a lot more blockage. So we are actually uh, had to use either the electrodynamic driver or a hydraulic driver. <clears throat> 
So we did all the adjustments, which I talked about earlier, and we came up with 1,890 kilowatts of acoustic power. 1,890 kilowatts of acoustic power. So we can't use just speakers for us to work with. <clears throat> so overall acoustic power is 1,890 kilowatt. Request spectra, I'm gonna show you. NASA gave us five different acoustic spectrum we have to meet. And then we are all going to go to use uh, what is called a nitrogen gas. We will take nitrogen fluid, compress them to produce nitrogen gas. Why do they use nitrogen gas? Unfortunately, air absorbs a lot of moisture. If you have a high humid air, or if you have high humidity anywhere, because we have something like 67,000 cubic feet of room, in a higher frequency, they actually absorb sound. Air actually absorbs sound. So we're going to lose between 5 to 10 decibels of sound level if we use uh, air. And it's very difficult to keep the air very, very dry. You cannot keep it at 0% humidity uh, for a long period of time. NASA wanted this for 20 minutes. So we end up going to nitrogen gas, GN2, and because we can keep it dry for a long period of time. Uh, for more than 30 minutes. Once you fill up the whole room with nitrogen gas, uh, it'll stay dry uh, before you have to throw it out and bring in fresh dry nitrogen for a long period of time. <clears throat> and that's why my joke about this facility is that uh, within one minute, you'll actually faint because you have 67,000 cubic feet of nitrogen gas. Uh, within, uh, sorry, within uh, one second, your bones will get crushed. Within a minute, you will faint and then immediately after that, you will die if you're in the room. It's such a powerful room. And then we decided to get a dr hydraulic drivers from Team Corporation because the electrodynamic drivers can only produce 30 kilowatts. They are very good in the mid frequencies. The low frequencies, their efficiency is very, very poor. Whereas the hydraulic driver, the piston heating against that uh, structure can produce very high level of sound level. <clears throat> so they, we actually want to test two of them. Mark 6 and Mark 7, 150 kilowatts at 200 PSI, 200 kilowatts at 200 PSI. The reason we are going to do this testing is that NASA wants to make sure that our design is working very well. So we had a test program and we used the a smaller chamber at National Research Council in Ottawa. And those of you who know Ottawa, <clears throat> NRC has got two different facilities, one in Montreal Road, one near the airport in the uplands. They have a supersonic wind tunnel. They also have a 573 cubic meter <clears throat> uh, reverberation test facility. <coughs> they use it very, very regularly. Um, a lot of people come from all over the place to do the test. And we decided to use exponential horn. <clears throat> so looking at all these things, by doing our calculations, we came up with Remember, this is the original design for five spectrum. We came up with 14 Mark 6 and Mark 7s and various cutoff frequencies of the 25 hertz horn. You can see that the square footage of the horn in the room is 50 square feet. It's about uh, something like seven feet by seven feet. And its horn length is 24.1 feet. So the one end of the horn is about one and a half inches square. And then, uh, sorry, one and a half inches diameter. And the other end is 50 inches square feet, square end. So this is over 24 feet. It's going to go from one inch square cube diameter circular pipe to all the way to 50 square feet, seven feet by seven feet um, square duct going to be in the room. So over 24 feet. So each of them, so that's why, it's, remember, if you want to do a hyperbolic horn, to fabricate it for these two conditions is very, very difficult. So that's why we went with exponential horn. Its uh, efficiency is 30%. We're very happy with that. <clears throat> so these are the <clears throat> five, uh, five spectrum which NASA wants us to feel. So they also want to test at very low level as well as the high level. And we showed them that we can meet that. So you can see that even the high frequency we are able to meet. So this is the five spectra NASA gave us uh, for our proposal. 
and we said, okay, this is what we're going to do. So, and with this, we actually won the contract uh, to the go through the final design, whatever we need. So I'm sort of halfway in between now, and I got only about 24 slides more. <coughs> and the reverberation time, you can see that at low frequency is 29 seconds. That means if you create a sound, an impulse sound, it takes 29 seconds for it to die down to one millionth of its sound level. And NASA was very pleased with that. Even high frequency is 6.6 .6 seconds. And so the sound level will stay there for a lot longer period of time. Of course, we are producing steady sound. We are not producing uh, impulse sound. So the design states, NASA want us to do a lot of tests. Uh, we started it, we won the contract uh, sometime April, May of 2007. We started our test program sometime later part of 2007 and early part of 2008. <clears throat> so NASA wanted us to test the Mark 6 and Mark 7 and do a lot of combinations, a lot of different pressures, a lot of bias settings for the hydraulic uh, pump and <clears throat> mix and match with different horns. Uh, they had a 31.5 hertz horn. 100 hertz horn and 100, uh, 200 hertz horn and then a 50 hertz horn. Four horns were available for us to do the test uh, at the Uplands facility in Ottawa. And then while well, in the middle of the, doing the test, NASA added one more test article. And the volume changed from 97,200 cubic feet. Now we needed additional volume, 2,754 cubic meter. And that actually immediately changed our total power requirement. So NASA went through some of these changes, uh, which made us to do go back to drawing board again and come up with a different number. So right now, instead of 1890, so every two, three dB of increase in acoustic uh, power level, the acoustic power increases doubling. So we had about two dB increase. So it went from 1890 to 2931 kilowatts. You can imagine the amount of uh, uh, drivers we need to provide this amount of acoustic power. <clears throat> so we went through two different uh, phase tests at NRC. The part one was from December 2007 to January 2008. <coughs> Excuse me. So the NRC chamber is 543 cubic meter in size, 32 feet by 22.6 feet by 26.3 feet. And <coughs> for us to validate the Mark 6 and Mark 7 are working very well, and then actually get acoustic test data from which we'll actually calculate the acoustic power from each of these uh, drivers and making sure those modulators are working very well. Remember, they promised us between 150 and 200 kilowatts of power. We want to make sure that we are actually getting those powers from them. Because we went blindfolded, believing the team's data, and we want to make sure that it's working OK. So we used Mark 6 and Mark 7, 12 hertz horn and 100 hertz horn. So I'm sorry putting a lot of text in here for you, but this is to show you what our findings were. Mark 6 and Mark 7 achieved the published acoustic power. Uh, no major impact on supply pressure. Actually, we found out that between 100 to 200 PSI, the power did not change very much. So we can actually even reduce the power to 150 PSI pressure. <clears throat> and then we actually tested <coughs> two modulators on two horns. And they actually resulted in the same acoustic output. And we connected two modulators to one horn, and then we actually made sure that it actually double 3 dB more of sound pressure. And then we also found out that reasonable variation with the acoustic spectrum uh, linearly with the input gain. So it was very good for us. <clears throat> the modulator optimal bias setting to hold the pressure 
was more than adequate for us because when you when it's working at a particular force, we want to make sure that the driven power it does not change drastically. <coughs> when we connected the horn to 100 hertz horn, the performance was poor. Of course, Mark 6 and Mark 7 were supposed to work very well in low frequency horns. That's their promise that. So we want to make sure that somehow we might be able to connect to a high frequency horn. It will work very well. And then NASA actually took this to uh, an army facility in Redstone in Alabama. And they did the test themselves with the horns and drivers that's there in the facility and gave us the results to us. And in phase two, uh, modulator efficiency, various spectral input signal shape for open loop testing. That means uh, the way we will shape the signal of input to the driver, uh, it's an open loop. It's not a control loop. So that means we, we have to manually provide the spectral shape. And we found out that uh, we can actually put different spectral shape and come up with a very good set of numbers. And we have to add a, an accumulator so that the gas pressure variation is not changing with the supply pressure. And unfortunately, we had a problem with the team modulator. There were two shaft failures. So the second test, we actually put some vibration sensors within the modulator um, drive construction to make sure that where is this fatigue is happening. And then team actually did their own testing back in Seattle. <clears throat> so we were able to confirm many of the uh, details which NASA wanted. And all the modulators worked very well from 25 hertz to 500 hertz and demonstrated excellent repeatability. So that's one thing that we have to make sure that, you know, one time we get a particular spectrum, this particular sound pressure level in the room, can we keep repeating it? So we were able to do that. <clears throat> and the high frequency uh, nonlinear flow, flowover and the flow noise were not were sufficient for the five words in the spectrum. <clears throat> and then the, during the second test, one more <laughs> shaft failure for the team modulator. NASA was quite concerned about that, but the team was able to do some testing in their factory in Seattle, and they were able to do their own uh, uh, report to NASA for that. <clears throat> then NASA did a red zone testing in May of 2008, and they were able to verify the team modulator performances, and uh, Bailey's was 3000, that's a electrodynamic uh, driver, and <clears throat> We were able to compare the uh, data between the Wiley was 3000 and the team Mark 6 and 7. NASA was quite happy with what team modelers were able to perform, provide. <clears throat> and they were also made sure that the, the team modelators worked very well with the high frequency horn. And uh, <clears throat> were able to keep the acoustic uh, um, show that Team modelers have performed better than the uh, electrodynamic uh, drivers by more than 6, 7 dB, which is a lot, and 2 to 3 dB in high frequency. Then in September of 2008, NASA came up with eight new spectrum for us to meet. We were working on five original spectra. Now suddenly we have to work with eight different spectrum. And some of them you can see in the high frequency, this, uh, these three spectra are quite large. They were actually about 140 dB at 8,000 hertz. Imagine trying to make 140 dB at 8,000 hertz. It's quite, uh, quite uh, I would say, quite nasty to do that. So we went through drawing board again wanting to look at how many speakers and drivers we need for that. So we looked at, we also did a couple of other tests. I'm going to show you uh, to provide much better high frequency. Uh, if you have a jet coming and hitting a plate, it creates quite a bit of high frequency sound. Now, how we found out what this, 
Uh, NASA did a lot of tests uh, with a particular type of aircraft called uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, where the aircraft engines will actually tilt, and both while taking off and landing. And they found that while landing, the jet that's hitting the ground create quite a bit of sonic boom type noise level on the ground. From that, we realized that if I have a jet hitting a plate, I could actually create quite a bit of high frequency sound. But unfortunately, we had a problem with that, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But in the meantime, I want to show you how we actually manage the eight spectrum. So C1 spectrum, we use eight modulators and six jets. So this is all actually theoretical prediction. We had enough data on the modulator. We had enough information on the jets. So we combine them together. As I said, open loop control. That means that we are shaping the spectrum of input. When you have the closed loop, and I'm going to talk about that later on uh, near the end, and uh, <clears throat> where we want to actually uh, control the overall spectrum in a particular way. So C1, you can see that in the high frequency at one particular 10,000 hertz, we are above the error band. Everywhere else, we, we are within the error band. So this is the error band. And with the horns and jets, I can see I'm able to meet up with the C1 spectrum. So this is the C1 spectrum, and this is the error band. I'm able to do that. Similarly, for C2, I am well within the error band. C3, I'm mean, actually again using six modulators and no jets. We are well within the error band because it's very low, low level of sound level. And it's very only with six drivers and no jets, I'm able to meet that. And then for the C4 spectrum, <clears throat> and we are again at one high frequency, we are outside the airband. In the low frequency, we are absolutely no problem. Only in the high end, and seven modulators and no jets, just outside the airband. <clears throat> C5 spectrum, 18 modulators and no jets, we are incredibly well within the error band, very close to the actual spectrum which NASA wanted. <clears throat> C6 spectrum, we are just above, again, the high frequency. We cannot get enough power to push it up. <clears throat> You're always lower than the lower error band. C7 spectrum, absolutely no problem again, because the high frequency is much lower. No jets again. <clears throat> C8 spectrum, again, absolutely no problem. 16 modulators and seven jets. And <clears throat> we are just below the high frequency end. <clears throat> so we did the phase two test. <clears throat> phase two is basically to do the <clears throat> impinging gas jets. And March to April of 2009. And then October 2009, again, a little bit of more testing to convince NASA. <clears throat> Where the October test, we actually had a control system. See, so far, we were actually creating a shape spectrum manually and sending it. Now here, we're going to give the NASA spectrum, and we have the control system to actually adjust that. That's what the closed loop is. And that was done by uh, uh, M plus P. It's a major corporation which pro produces the acoustic control system for many different applications. <clears throat> and we March to April 2009, we did an impinging gas test. And I'm going to show you some results of the impinging gas test. <clears throat> so here is um, anywhere between 100 to 200 PSI. Uh, here is the jet that's going to come out of here, hit this plate. You can see I've been getting quite substantial amount of high frequency sound. But unfortunately, they're all very single frequencies. Strong tones, uh, like if you play uh, a tuning fork, it creates a strong tone. So we're getting strong tone. NASA was not happy with that because, you know, strong tones can create resonance within the test articles, uh, or it's maybe it's cover plate. And if there's a resonance, that particular plate will fail. So we don't want any tones anywhere 
within the spectrum. So we were not, and then we tried to reduce the tonal capacity by putting some little chevron here with three of them here. Chevron, like when you go on a highway, you see the chevron. So we had a plate shaped like a chevron, three of them. It actually reduced all the tones, completely eliminated the tones. But unfortunately, when you do that, the overall sound pressure level also came down. So we were not very happy with that. So we want 140 dB at 8,000 hertz. When you put the chevron, without the chevron, we were able to get 140 dB. But with the chevron, it came down well below 130 dB. So the jet noise was <clears throat> Uh, creating high frequency sound using jet uh, was not practical in this application. So finally, NASA accepted our final design. So we are having the chamber volume 47.5 feet long, 37.5 feet high, wide, and 57 feet high, 101,000 cubic feet. 23T modulators and 13 was 5,000 modulators. Was 5,000 is usually for high frequency and it provides up to 10 kilowatt of power. Horns, 36, grouped at seven different horn cutout frequencies. And the nitrogen flow comes at 70,000 CFM. And the door is 31.5 feet long. Here is the uh, horn room, it's the main door. This door is two foot thick concrete with steel covering. And I weigh only 125 pounds. I can actually move this door, it slides so beautifully. I can open this door by myself. And uh, there's a little jog here, NASA didn't worry about that. And main doors are two of them, and this is the back door in case of emergency. And this is the horn room. This is where all the 36 uh, drivers and horns will be there. And the nitrogen gas will come in here, and, the, and all the horns will be on this wall. And we jokingly call this wall Swiss cheese wall, and I'll show you why. <clears throat> the overall sound level is 163 decibels, overall sound pressure level. And we actually commissioned, so this is the horn layout. You can see that the one wall, got 36 horns in here, seven feet by seven feet for 25 hertz horn, goes over 24.5 feet to one inch diameter pipe, uh, where the hydraulic drivers connect itself. And so here is the final uh, actual picture of the room. And we commissioned this in 2011 September. We were actually went up to 161.5 dB. When we went to 162 dB, the whole thing shut down. And we were worried, what happened? Everything shut down immediately. Find out there's a little door somewhere over here, a jogging. A uh, two foot thick uh, small door which started shaking, even though the whole room was closed with a two foot thick wall. And because that door shook, there was an emergency stop right on the door. The entire system shut down. So, this is an we have something like 20 different emergency stops all around this facility because you don't want anybody to be even in that vibration shaker room. Uh, something can go wrong. So uh, this was one of the things that happened while I was there in September of 2011. So here is the vibration shaker, and this is the reverberation acoustic facility. You can see that they were actually starting to test with some of the Orion articles, uh, various components of that. So this is the actual room, 57 feet high, 47 point something like that long, and 38 point feet wide. And these are the various horns. This is the 25 hertz horn, seven feet by seven feet, four of them. Four of them <clears throat> providing incredible amount of low frequency sound power. So here is an actual test they did sometime in 2012. So this will actually, if everything is successful, this will actually go to Mars. I mean, you want to land in Mars, uh, this particle will be there uh, before they launch it. <clears throat> I'm done. So the time right now, 8.24. Yeah, close to 55 minutes. Yep. All right. Oh, thank you, Professor. Um, we Before we open up the floor to questions,
questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your great presentation. Um, and uh, I guess I can start it off with asking um, a few of my questions. Um, you said, for example, uh, the spatial uniformity contours that were generated uh, were using uh, some unique software. Can you tell us a little bit about what that process was like? Yeah. Um, there's a software called SysNoise. Uh, they're actually bought up by ANSYS right now. So it's a final element modeling program where you put a source of sound and at various frequencies, we can actually generate, you give some sound power, some unique sound power, and it'll generate all the sound level within the room. And then there is also a software which I used recently called Comsol, and Comsol can do exactly the same thing. So this is, Comsol is very expensive. Uh, for academic license, it's about $3,000 a year. If you are using from industry or commercial purposes, it's about $20,000 a year. So I was able to use, for this program, we had SysNoise, Aeolus had, um, both ray noise and cis noise uh, for room acoustics, and we use cis noise to generate the, the three curves. We generated hundreds of these curves to convince NASA. I only showed you three of them at one particular height. We generated at every one meter, all the way across every one meter uh, in all directions, and then we showed the various variation of sound level for spatial uniformity, and NASA was convinced that our design is very much adequate for them. All right, thank you. And another question I had before um, I make a few announcements is um, about the process of uh, manufacturing the exponential um, horns. Mm -hmm. um, were you part of that process or do you know what it's like? No, no, I was not. Uh, Sergio Raimondo, <clears throat> um, he was a mechanical engineer, aerospace engineer. And there's a particular, you know, what you do then is that uh, you cut the horn yeah. and then you lay it out. And then this is a typical uh, wood cutting people would do, metal cutting people will do, fabrication people will do. And then you just got to give the various dimensions to go from there. And then we have the exponential equation is available to us. And <clears throat> using that, we just lay it on the sheet. And then using AutoCAD, we can actually generate how from the beginning to the end, from the inlet, from the driver modulator to the end to the room, uh, you can just lay it out and then people can manufacture it very easily. Hyperbolic horn is much more complicated because it's got three, four different directions it changes. Right. Uh, and to lay it out and, I mean, it, these days with 3D printing, it's probably even much faster. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, that's great. So as we're waiting for um, some questions to come in, um, I'd like to kind of uh, reiterate some of the messaging from earlier for those of you that um, are just joining us or have recently joined. Um, Space Place Planetarium Canada is a nonprofit multidisciplinary group of professionals uh, determined to bring an iconic physical public planetarium uh, back to Toronto, um, as well as supporting a virtual planetarium for Canada and the world. Uh, Toronto has not had a public planetarium since 1995 and the city is the largest tourist city without one. It's a critical missing piece of Toronto's tourism and educational infrastructure. Uh, we encourage the audience to get involved and email us to inquire about our work, uh, being a volunteer or applying to be a member. We are engaged in advocacy and planning, recruitment, events like tonight, and, and fundraising. So we are also asking for donations um, and so if you uh, make a small donation of $10, uh, you can receive a, a, a unique download card with planetarium music from the McLaughlin Planetarium. Um, and also for a donation of $50 or more, uh, you not only get the music card, but you'll also get a Space Place Canada branded face mask, um, as well as Bob McDonald's book titled An Earthling's Guide to Outer Space, uh, which is a great read, but also a, a great uh, gift idea as well. Um, whether you want the music card only or the combination of the three for the swag, um, please send us your mailing address to the email on the screen, which is chair at spaceplacecanada.ca. Um, we've also included the uh, donation link in the chat. And tonight we've been, been lucky enough to be joined with Dr. Ramakrishnan, 
And uh, I'd like to open up the floor to, to questions from the audience now. Okay, uh, while we're waiting, um, I do have another question. Um, can you tell us about the importance of um, the, the vibration test chamber uh, to, to rocketry or, or Canadian, um, Canadian aerospace? <clears throat> uh, you know, for, for example, even the Canada Arm, I'm sure it went through the vibration test. So what they do there is that, you know, um, when you launch some of these rockets boosters that are going to uh, launch these vehicles, they pr produce very high level of sound as well as very high level of vibration. Mm -hmm. So if these articles had some vibration issues, uh, when you launch them, they'll break apart. So what they do there is they'll put it on that. Let me show you the picture of that. Um, Can I get my slides on? Yep, you're, you're, you're showing them now. Yeah, so I'm going to show the first uh, picture. You can see that. So they'll place it on this. This shaker can produce up to 10 G of force, which is one hell of a lot. And it can actually shake it translationally up and down, left right. to right. Uh, translationally, all the three translation as well as three rotations. So you can shake it in all six degrees of freedom all at the same time. You can do one at a time or you can do all six, you can do two. And they want to, while they're doing that, for example, <clears throat> my room has got something like 150 acoustic sensors and about 200 vibration sensors. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, so the, the data acquisition, acquisition system itself cost a few million dollars. And uh, so the vibration, so they will probably instrument this uh, with hundreds and hundreds of vibration sensors. And they want to make sure that when they're shaking it, what is the uh, vibration spectrum is and what is the levels are. And if they're drawing board saying that, okay, this is too much, then they got to go back, maybe stiffen something up, or uh, redo the design. Well, what yeah. about the placement as well, right? I mean, uh, maybe the sensors have to be reoriented, perhaps. No, no, they they they're going to put two hundred sensors, so they do, you don't have oh, to. Oh, it doesn't matter, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That's a good you point. have so many sensors, so they would have many of them will be uh, all the three axis sensors. Okay, so they measure uh, in all three directions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, All right, we have a few questions in the chat now. Um, yeah. Todd is asking, um, what were the mechanisms in place uh, to achieve six degrees of freedom for the shaker? Um, measurements, okay. I did not design the vibration shaker. They have, perhaps, the way to answer that question is that uh, maybe you could go to team corporations and ask for the vibration shaker. They might show all the springs they have to move them and rotate them. Okay. So I was not involved in the design of this vibration shaker. Team supplied this. Is it, just go to team corporation in Washington State, Seattle, uh, just outside Seattle. And they might have some pictures of the vibration shaker with all its innards showing. And right. from that, you might be able to figure out how they're going to move uh, in all the six degrees of freedom. I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer that question because I didn't do anything with that. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question from Henry. Um, can you describe your experience as a Canadian working at NASA? What do Canadian aerospace companies have to do more of in addressing vibration and noise? <clears throat> I think uh, it's a very good question. Um, NASA is very open to 
anyone who's got the knowledge to come and work with them. Uh, AOS Engineering has got quite a lot of projects in the US. Uh, we designed uh, a similar chamber for uh, China Lake in, the, in California and uh, supersonic wind tunnels. So I think what we do need to do as a Canadian is to have a good aerospace degree and work with uh, some companies. Quite a lot of, for example, Canada Arm was designed by Spar Aerospace. So we are uh, incredibly uh, forward in having very good aerospace education. And the only few companies available for us, unfortunately, is not a large number of them. And if you can somehow get together with them, incredible amount of projects available. And the US is very open. And um, it was difficult because after 9-11, NASA's security was so tight. Every time six of us or three of us went to uh, the Space Center in Sandusky, Ohio, they completely got hold of our passports. And then all the rental car have to be separated. And then they will take us in their own bus, minibus to the site where we are going to be. And then if you have to go to the washroom, I have to have an NASA guy come with me to make sure that I don't go to areas which I'm not supposed to go. They're incredibly uh, security conscious about these things, but it's okay. On the whole, they were very, very friendly. They realized that they uh, sort of understood that we, are, we know what we are doing. Once they got the little trust in us, after that, they became very helpful in many ways. And then just a little side story, uh, Houston Johnson Space Center wanted this facility to be in Houston. Okay. So they would come for many meetings, started criticizing uh, rightfully or wrongfully uh, for the, some of our techniques. But NASA Glenn used to come to our defense. So many times, I don't even have to answer the question. Bill Hughes will stand up and answer the question and make the people from Johnson Space Center to keep quiet. So, so I, what I'm hearing is um, there's, you know, a sense of camaraderie and, uh, you know, once you contribute to the program, then you're kind of, you know, you build that relationship for life, which is good to hear. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we do have one more. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. We have one more question from Kirsten, um, mm -hmm. and she's asking, what are some more non-space applications for this work that we might run across in everyday life? Uh, <clears throat> You know, sometimes Pratt & Whitney comes and do this test at NRC. Uh, this is not for a space application, it's some of their own design. Uh, <clears throat> for example, some years ago, um, one of the engines rivet was not done properly and it failed. The fine element modeling did not show a good uh, response or somebody made a mistake with the rivet. And so some of the aerospace companies would come do their own test in there. This is not only for space application, even for aircraft industry applications, right. these facilities can be used, yes. All right, great. And actually to follow up um, with that question, are there acoustic chambers in, in Canada? And if there are, um, what, what, kind, what, what kinds of things do they do? Where was this again? Acoustic chambers in, in Canada. There is only, <clears throat> there's only one chamber in Canada. And the National Research Council, yeah, because it's very expensive to run these chambers. Yeah, I can for imagine. example, uh, when NASA wants to do a twenty-minute test, the nitrogen gas is going to cost forty thousand dollars for the twenty minutes. Right. So imagine, um, even though NRC uses air, you have to pressurize that huge uh, way, uh, huge pipes they have. You know, they have something like. 100 meter long pipe, about 10 inches diameter, three of them. It's filled with air compressed to 200 PSI, 250 PSI pressure. Right. They're all very expensive to do. You know, this testing program costs NASA a lot of money. I think this whole uh, test chamber, both the vibration plus the acoustic, came to about $80 million. Oh, wow. And, and, I, and I'm sure it adds up too over the years. and with everything just becoming more and more expensive these days. Exactly. Um, yeah. All right. 
Well, thank you for, for answering that question. We have another one from Henry. Um, what role does the Canadian Space Agency play in acoustic research, if any? And is your contributions in the U.S. considered a Government of Canada contribution? Uh, my Our contribution is a private industry. Uh, Canadian government had nothing to do with that. So we, Aeolus Engineering is one of the top two companies in the world which designs test cells. Uh, they are very famous in designing aeroacoustics and supersonic wind tunnels all over the world. And they did the design for the LEAF in Netherlands. And since that time, since NASA's project, we have designed two other smaller chambers. Another one is called the progressive wave tube, which is not big, okay. but then it even wants much higher sound pressure level. It's just like a waveguide, maybe a four feet by four feet uh, rectangular square uh, pipe where they put articles in there, excite them to 180 dB sound level. So, uh, so we've designed, so we've uh, had quite a bit of success on designing these chambers. And uh, so, but it's a private industry. We don't get any money from the government of Canada. Okay, that is good to know. Um, so going back to, to NRC's test chamber in Ottawa, um, what kinds of applications come out of that work? <clears throat> they do quite a little bit of uh, uh, aerospace industry, aircraft industry, aerospace industry testing. They are very, very busy. Right. And they're also connected to the supersonic wind tunnel right next door. So and that tunnel also is very, very busy. Uh, to give an example, uh, while we are doing our testing, they needed the high pressure air for the supersonic wind tunnel during the daytime. Right. So we did the test at night. And we would start our testing around seven o'clock at night, go till about two o'clock in the morning. And would you believe it? NASA wanted a report at eight o'clock next morning. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would go to my room my, with my laptop. I would work from 2.30 to 4, take a nap from 4 to 6.30, get up, have a quick shower, breakfast, run oh back to offlands, and give a report to NASA between 8 and 8.30. And this happened over three whole weeks. I stayed well, in I hope it was worthwhile in the end. Oh, yes. It's a weird, you know, one good thing, engineers, we work long hours. We work hard, and it pays off in the end. Yeah. There's one good thing about engineering. That's for sure. Well, um, let's see if we have any other questions. Uh, Henry is asking, what applications? Oh, no, that's the same one. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Julie now, just in the interest of time, um, for a few closing remarks. And uh, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Ramakrishnan, for um, your, your talk tonight and um, entertaining some of the questions at the end as well. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ramakrishnan, for uh, taking the time to uh, prepare this talk for us uh, and for uh, telling us all about this uh, amazing project uh, that probably most people did not know very much about uh, before this evening. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everyone for uh, tuning in this evening. And we look forward to our next event. Uh, don't think we have anything pinned down yet, but uh, check our website, uh, spaceplacecanada.ca uh, for details under the events tab for that. So thank you everyone. And thanks everyone for inviting me. It was, it was a joy to be sharing my uh, work. Uh, it was amazing for me because I started my career with as a student at NASA and near the end of my career, I was able to get a major project with NASA. So that was really critical for me. And I'm very happy about that. Thanks again for inviting me and all the best. Let's hope bring the planetarium to Toronto. Yes, we are working very hard towards that. Thank you so much. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Take care.